The Killer Angels by Michael Sharp. I got to read this uh, historical fiction book because in my A3 class, my history teacher made us read it. And actually, Michael Shara is the father of Jeff Shara, who wrote uh, another historical fiction called The Rise to Rebellion. And it's about the American Revolution. This is about the Civil War. And uh, my the history class read this until like last year. And then my history teacher just decided to switch to this. I think it's harder. Personally, I think it's harder. So, um... There is a lot of background in this since it is a historical fiction and it's not one of those historical fiction books that kind of like make it so fictional that make you want to enjoy it. I'll tell you like ahead of time, this is really boring. Like it's one of, it's probably the most boring book I've ever read. More than my science textbook. I am not kidding. Okay, this is, um, this is based on the Civil War as I said, but the Civil War is a span of centuries, yeah, centuries, and so they can't put that in like a book. So they chose the one of the most important battles in the Civil War, which is the Battle of Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg took place in Gettysburg, and it was a fight between the Confederate and the Union. Now, for those of you that don't know anything about the Civil War, I'll tell you right now because I don't know—I didn't know anything about the Civil War before I read this book, and I was forced to do research on it. Okay. So, the Union is um, the northern part of the United States. The Confederates are the southern part of the United States. Now, um, there is still a debate about like why the Civil War started. Like, why did it start? Some people, most people, actually say slaves are the issue because the confederates wanted the slaves because they didn't have like anyone else they only had um high people and regular people and slaves they didn't have any other uh, class or other outside people or immigrants to come and work for them for money so they they were kind of forced to have slaves because being lazy is part of human nature however on the opposite hand the union had a since it was on the top there were a bunch of um, <clears throat> people from Asia and um, Europeans coming, and they were immigrants. So they made this like rule that like immigrants have to work, but they'll pay them. So unions, so the union people didn't need slaves. So they're like, oh, like since like your slaves are black, you're being racist. So they started like offending the Confederates, and then this like whole fight started. And personally, I agree that slavery was the start, but. I don't know. There's there isn't really a exact reason why a war starts. So um back into this book. This is a whole bunch of war. So this is actually a a peculiar book. So in the beginning, there's the foreword, and it describes like the armies and kind of like the general background, which I just told you. And if you go a little bit more, there's uh the men. And it lists the uh, major characters and um, main people during the Battle of Gettysburg from both the Confederate and the Union. Okay, so uh, also this is divided into four sections. This is uh, Monday, June 29th, 1863. It, uh, that was uh, two days, yeah, two days, I think, before the uh, Battle of Gettysburg actually started. And um, so this was kind of like the preparation day, and then um, once you read this section, it's going to tell you how they prepared, how they are preparing for the upcoming battle. And also, what's cool and neat is that um, inside these four sections, there's more sections. I know, it sucks. Um, the first section of the first section is the spy. And I will tell you about that right now. So um, at first, I'm like, oh, isn't it supposed to be historical fiction? Is it some like action adventure? It's about historical fiction. It is, sadly. So um, so this, this is going to get a little complicated, but you just have to hang in there, okay? So there's the Confederate and the Union, or Union and Confederate. And they're um, prepping for the one of the greatest artillery ever fired and they need to prepare but some people don't have enough troops some people aren't prepared so it kind of becomes
chaotic. So what they do is what all the other war generals basically did. They sent a spy to uh, spy on the other team. So um, the book starts off as um, in with the Confederate. So the, the spy was from the Confederate, sent to a spy on the Union of its uh, location, like according to Washington, D.C., Gettysburg, and the Confederates themselves. Now, um, why did I say Washington, D.C.? Because Washington, D.C. is the, as you know, is the capital of the United States. One, and that Washington, D.C. Um, is included in the Union part. So once they took control of Washington, D.C., the Confederates take control of the entire Union since it is the capital. And Washington, D.C. was um, very close to the border, borderline of the Confederates and the Unions. So if they just penetrated like a few miles of Union troops, they could get to Washington, D.C. So they wanted to check if the Union troops were close, or like if they could make a move. And if the Union troops were marching in on them, then they would die because Union has a lot more troops than the Confederates. And a lot, I mean like maybe four or 5,000, and that might not seem like much, but it is when it comes to battles. Like, it is. So um, that's that. So um, that's why the Confederates, I, I think we're at like a little bit more of a disadvantage than the Union. Since the Union did have better artillery, better men, and they had, um, they had this, uh, Art, they had this uh, army of uh, George Pickett, and I'll talk about him later. Oh, there's so many characters. But um, that that division was like like the best. It was kind of like the top of the pyramid, where like if they go in, then they win. That's how uh, well trained the troops were. Even though there weren't as many troops, they were actually quite. There were quite a few, there were only a few hundred. However, um, I will talk about this later, like really late in the book, towards the end. Uh, Pickett's Charge, uh, that's when uh, that division comes in. And I keep talking about divisions and war and armies, and I know it's all confusing, so I'll explain. So, uh, a division, well, I'll just tell you in case you don't know. So a division is a part of an army. So there's this like huge army, hundred thousands of people, and then maybe like ten thousand of them are a division. Another ten thousand are a division. Twenty thousand division. So there are many divisions in one army. If if the general chooses not to have divisions and just have like one giant army, which is really stupid, then they could do that. But unless you're stupid, you wouldn't do that. So um, those are divisions, and then um, they're gonna talk about um the core. And it's not spelled C O R E. It's actually spelled C O R P S. So um, I was reading it, and I'm like, oh, corpse. And then my sister teacher is like, no, a corpse is a dead body. It's pronounced core. And core is kind of like the same as a division, but it's more like military language. It's like, you know, like cool stuff. So back to the first section. We're only on the first chapter of the first section. Oh no. Okay, the spy's name was Harrison, and that doesn't really matter because he never comes out after this one. But it's nice to know people's things. It's nice to get to know them. So he spies in the Union, and then um, that's kind of like the end of chapter one. It kind of ends like abruptly. Um, section two starts off with uh, Chamberlain, and Chamberlain is a general of the Confederate, and um, He's kind of like the highest-ish, yeah. Like out of the generals, he's kind of like the highest. So um, it starts off as uh, his um, one of the other working people in the army. I don't know everyone in ranks. So, so um, his name is Kilrain, like Kilrain, Kilrain. He approaches Chamberlain with 120 mutineers. What are mutineers? I will explain that. Mutineers are like rebels. So um, the 120 mutineers are from the Union. 
So they came down to the Confederate because um, what happened was they were included in the army and then they were promised, they were guaranteed to go back to their homes after like, after that, um, after some kind of battle, but then they, uh, the army kept them there. So they weren't allowed to go, there, go to their homes and see their families, so they rebelled against that army. They came, um, they came to Chamberlain to seek assistance since the Confederates did need more troops. So what Chamberlain did was he could have just shot them since they were Union troops. He could have just shot them and be like, oh, get out of my land, something like that, but then he did it. What he did was he took care of them, he fed them, he gave them clothes, he gave them shelter, he made them his men. So now that's a little bit more of an advantage because then like, the Union's trust was a little more dismantled. And so those uh, 120 mutineers went to Chamberlain, and then starting the third chapter is uh, the Union. So um, this book, as you read it, it will be really confusing, but I'll, I will tell you that in each in the, the four sections, it switches back. Every chapter, um, like one chapter is Chamberlain, another chapter is Lee, another chapter is some Union officer, Buford, and it's um, it's confusing, but then they are kind, of, they are related, and once in a while it will show you maps of the situation that evening or the morning, so that helps you understand more, and make sure to look at the maps really carefully because it really does help. So um, the third chapter of the first section is Buford. Buford is a general, uh, is a cavalry general of the Union. Now I'm um, not a uh, cavalry. Cavalry, not Calvary. That's like some like church thing. Cavalry is mounted men, as in men on horses. Now, um, why is that advantageous? Well, duh, they're like two feet higher than the other people. So, um, no matter like, let's say there was a group of five hundred cavalry men and a thousand just um walking or yeah walking men, then um, I would say the cavalry would win, even though they're like half the size of them. They do have the, more of the advantage. They can take long shots, they can take close-up shots, and they're higher up, they can see all the situation. It's perfect. Unless the horse dies. And they feel bad for a horse. Anyways, so um, everything about this war, everything about every single war, I'm not being biased here, I'm telling the truth. Every single war is about advantages, disadvantages, true, I mean, not truth, uh, reliability, and cheating. So, you think that like wars are all shooting and stuff, and like only the strong men go? Not really. All the generals do all the stuff that's up here, and the other stupid people just go like, Ugh. So all the generals have to make all these plans and it's super confusing and super tough like how I felt when I read this book. So what happened was if you get the high ground, it's kind of like the same advantage as being on being a cavalry unit. Uh, you get high ground is even higher than cavalry unit. You could uh, you can shoot down and since that since you are on higher ground, the people down below can't shoot you because you're like shooting at their faces. And that's like one of, that is the biggest advantage that you could ever get, the high ground. So what happened was um, Buford uh, was commanded to take the high ground on Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Hill is just like, it's a, there's like a range of hills. Cemetery Hill is just one of them. Another one is like Little Round Top, Cemetery Ridge, bunch more. It is like 82 degrees in here, so if I sweat, it's a little, maybe because of the history. So um, he was he was told to keep, keep the high ground, and it kind of explains like why you have to take the high ground and like the orders and all of that. And then it concludes with the fourth chapter of the first section. The, um, the fourth chapter is uh, called uh, Chamberlain. But then uh, he's also part of the uni. Um, the fourth chapter, it's not really specific on like, it's not really detailed. So what happens is just that um, General, General uh, John Hancock, I think, 
John, General John Hancock goes to Chamberlain and they have a discussion about war strategy and all that. And then Armistead goes, he's another general. And then um, they'll go and talk about like war strategy and stuff. So um, I don't know if I should like... I, I shouldn't tell you like every single detail because I kind of am right now. So the fourth chapter you can... Uh, I, I'll leave it up to you to figure out what happens. That is the conclusion of the first section. Now that was really long and tiring for me. Probably for you to hear all this historical nonsense. But it's the truth. It's what happened in reality. And um, what I will do is, is that since this is a really hard and thick and juicy book, I have to get every single detail out of it, kind of almost like I'm reading the book to you. So I can't do that unless I have like two hours. So I will divide all of the book reviews into four sections. This is the first section, part one, and the part two would come like really little later. Um, I mentioned in the beginning of this uh, book review that we read this in class. So what we had an assignment on the Battle of Gettysburg. It's not necessarily on the Killer Angels, but it's just a broad <clears throat> general overview on the Battle of Gettysburg. So um, there was we had to we. They, she split the uh, class into two groups. One was the Union, one was the Confederate. Which one was easier? The Union. Duh, duh, duh. And you might not be understanding why I say duh, but spoiler alert. In case you don't know, Union wins the Civil War in the Battle of Gettysburg. It's pretty sad for the Confederates. Ooh. So anyways, back to what I was saying. So we had to write a newspaper and um, people were assigned different topics and stuff. And apparently I got the hardest one. There's this one guy that want I want to do the escape slave story, but this guy came and took my part. Like, do you understand? You're on camera, you're on camera. So, I decided to take a new part and um, yield my wonderful escape slave story part to a, uh, not an acquaintance, a class, class. I got war news. So there, um, I had to write a full on documentary on the Battle of Gettysburg. I hated it. I had to, there was this weekend where like, I had to stay up for like, not stay up for like, but do like 20 hours of research and like watch like five documentaries and like finally like piece up this like wonderful piece of like masterpiece. And I will share with you that it will be posted later. And um, I, I think it will be posted uh, after the after like all, all my book reviews for this book ends. And, but even if I post it before, I don't think you should read like all like actually never mind actually never mind you should read that first. I'll, I'll post it soon. I'll post it like right now. So um you should read that because it will help you a lot. And if it doesn't, save it, folks. Twenty hours. So read that and it gives you a full on background um information, just not on the first section because there's really not much to write about prep. Days. So I have one on the first day, the second day, and the third day. There are three days of the Battle of Gettysburg. And you hopefully read my background research that I work 24. 24. Now that I think about it, it's 24 hours. So read that. And then hopefully you will enjoy my historical background research and understand this book a little better because that's really all that matters, right? Not how much work I put into it. So I will end this book review by, um, bye.